Hey everyone, thanks for joining us for another deep dive. And a uh, big shout out to Lit RPG Reads and uh, Paul Bello, that fine fella. He always seems to come up with really cool ideas for us to dig into. Today we're looking at the concept of living dungeons. You know, um, I'm sure some of you out there have run into this concept in your own games, but uh, it's an idea that always sort of fascinated me. I remember one time I was running a game for my group and uh, they were exploring these ancient ruins, right? Typical adventuring stuff. At first it was just, you know, crumbling walls, dusty corridors, the usual stuff. But then things started getting a little weird. Like all the torches in one room just went out all of a sudden as if something sucked all the air out. And we started feeling these tremors too underfoot. Not like an earthquake, but more like a, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but it felt like a heartbeat. It was really subtle at first. But the more we explored, the more intense it got. We all started to feel like the dungeon itself was like watching us reacting to our every move. That's kind of the core idea behind a living dungeon, isn't it? It's not just a setting anymore. It's like a character with its own goals and motivations. It turns the whole dungeon from a static location into like an active participant in the story. Yeah, you got it. That's exactly what makes living dungeons so interesting. They blur the lines between setting and character. You know, Ken Chan over at Litter PG Reads calls it the living labyrinth in his article. It, he really nails it with that title, I think, because it emphasizes how the dungeon itself becomes like a crucial part of the narrative. He goes on to describe all these key features that set a living dungeon apart from your typical dungeon crawl. One of the coolest ideas he brings up is sentient rooms. And we're not just talking about spooky whispers or doors slamming shut here. We're talking about rooms that actually react to the players being there. Like maybe a chamber that seals shut, trapping the players inside. Or walls that move, revealing secret passages. It really messes with the players' heads, you know? It gives them this feeling that the environment itself is aware and responding to their every move. So it's not just about atmosphere then. It's like the dungeon is actually engaging with the players, almost like a DM in its own right. I like that. Chan also talks about organic architecture, which is another great way to make a dungeon feel alive. He describes these really vivid images like corridors pulsing like arteries, walls rippling with a heartbeat you can actually feel, rooms that shift and flow like they're made of living tissue. It's not just exploring a dungeon anymore. It's like venturing inside some kind of organism. Right. The way he writes about it, it's like... You can almost feel the dungeon breathing around you. It's creepy, but also kind of cool. He talks about these root networks too, these plant-like structures that grow all over the dungeon, and they can actually reach out and grab at the players, adding this whole other level of danger. It's not just about what you see anymore, it's about what you feel. You're constantly aware that you're inside something that could react in all sorts of unexpected ways. But it's not all just spooky aesthetics either. Chan gets into the nuts and bolts of how a living dungeon actually works. Specifically, he talks about growth systems. And the interesting thing here is that the player's actions can directly influence how the dungeon evolves. So for example, imagine a rogue touches a glowing wall thinking it's harmless. And suddenly an exit seal shut or thorny barriers spring up. It's like the environment itself is a puzzle that the players can either learn to manipulate or be manipulated by. I see what you mean. It's like the dungeon is playing a game of its own. And if the players are smart enough, they might figure out how to use these growth systems to their advantage, maybe creating shortcuts, diverting dangerous encounters, or even turning the environment against its own inhabitants. It adds this whole strategic layer to the game where players have to think beyond just combat and consider how their actions impact the dungeon itself. I like it. It's a really neat idea. Definitely. It keeps things fresh and unpredictable. And that's where the idea of dynamic challenges and encounters comes in. In a living dungeon, challenges aren't static or pre-programmed. They adapt to the player's actions and choices. Chan actually outlines how different encounter types can become dynamic and unpredictable in this way. So take combat, for example. In a typical dungeon, clearing out a group of enemies usually makes things easier, right? But in a living dungeon, it might trigger the opposite effect. Maybe the dungeon spawns reinforcements, strengthens its defenses, or even closes off escape routes. It turns a supposed victory into a desperate struggle for survival. It keeps the players on their toes and forces them to constantly rethink their strategies. So you're saying the dungeon can actually learn and adapt, almost like a sentient being. It's always trying to outsmart the players and turn their expectations against them. That's really cool. It's a brilliant way to keep things challenging, even for experienced players. Exactly. It's like the dungeon is a DM with a particularly devious mind, always ready to throw a curveball at the players, always trying to keep them guessing and on their toes. And it's not just the environment that reacts to the players either. The creatures inside a living dungeon can also evolve and adapt. Oh yeah, the evolving creatures section. I remember that. 
Mm -hmm. They're not just static monsters waiting to be killed, are they? Nope, not at all. They can actually change based on what the players do. It's not mm -hmm. just your typical hack and slash dungeon crawl anymore. Exactly. Let's say your party loves using fire magic, right? Well, in a living dungeon, the creatures they fight might start to develop a resistance to fire over time. It forces the players to switch up their tactics and not just rely on one thing. That's interesting. You could accidentally end up training the dungeon's monsters to resist your best attacks. Yeah. It's like an arms race between the players and the dungeon always trying to outdo each other. That's a good way to put it. The article even suggests that creatures can fuse together into stronger opponents based on how the party fights. So, like, if the party favors melee combat, a bunch of smaller creatures might combine into one big, tough monster that's really good at close combat. It's kind of terrifying when you think about it. Yeah, that's the stuff of nightmares. <laughs> it also makes you think about the consequences of your actions. Yeah. It's not just about winning a fight. It's about understanding that every victory could have unintended consequences down the line. Mm -hmm. It makes you think long term, which is always good for a game. Absolutely. And then there are the traps. And these aren't your typical pressure plates and tripwires either. Oh, no. These are what Chan calls interactive tracks. So the traps are smart, too. I'm really getting nervous. They can react and adapt to the player's behavior, which makes them even more dangerous. Imagine a seemingly harmless magic circle on the wall suddenly turning into a spinning blade trap as the players walk by. It keeps everyone on edge constantly looking for potential threats. Yeah, that'll keep you on your toes. You can't just relax and assume you're safe anywhere. It's like the dungeon is always watching, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. That's right. It adds a whole other level of tension and paranoia to the game. That's what I love about the living dungeon concept. It makes things so much more dynamic and unpredictable. You never know what's going to happen next. Mm. But Chan doesn't just focus on the mechanics of it all. He also talks about how to tie all these features into a good story. He calls it tying player goals to the dungeon. Basically, it's about using the dungeon's reactions to shape the story in a meaningful way. Yeah. That's what takes the living dungeon from a bunch of cool ideas to a truly immersive experience. Like, let's say the players are on a rescue mission. Well, the dungeon might sense that and start blocking pathways, summoning guardians, or even changing its layout to create dead ends and force the players to take detours. So the dungeon becomes like an active antagonist working against the player's goals. Oh. It's not just about overcoming challenges anymore. It's about navigating a complex web of cause and effect. Right. And the cool thing is that the dungeon's reactions can be tailored to the player's specific goals. If they're trying to find a magical artifact, the dungeon might hide it and move it, or even set traps specifically designed to stop them. It turns a simple fetch quest into a dynamic and unpredictable chase. So it's like the dungeon is playing a game with the players, always trying to stay one step ahead. It makes you wonder, though, could a dungeon go beyond just being an antagonist? Could it actually develop some kind of relationship with the players? I mean, Chan mentions symbiotic relationships in his article, which suggests that the dungeon isn't always hostile. That's one of the most interesting things about living dungeons, the idea that players could actually form alliances with the dungeon if their goals align. It really shakes things up and opens up a lot of possibilities for role-playing and storytelling. So instead of constantly fighting the dungeon, the players might actually be able to negotiate with it, trade favors, or even work together towards a common goal. It's like diplomacy, but with a dungeon. I like it. Imagine the players having to decipher cryptic messages to appease the dungeon and gain access to a forbidden area. Yeah, that's a cool idea. Of course, any alliance with a dungeon would be pretty fragile, right? One wrong move, and the players could find themselves back on the dungeon's bad side. Oh, definitely. Yeah, it adds a whole other layer of uncertainty and tension to the game. You constantly have to be thinking about the consequences of your actions. And speaking of consequences, one of the coolest things about living dungeons is their potential for long-term campaign impact. They're not just a one-shot adventure, are they? Nope. They can evolve and change over time, becoming a core part of the game world. That's awesome. It's like the dungeon is growing and adapting alongside the players and the world around it. Exactly. Imagine the dungeon developing its own factions and politics, or new biomes and ecosystems emerging as the dungeon expands. The possibilities are endless. It's like the dungeon becomes a microcosm of the larger world. Right, and the player's actions can have a real lasting impact on this world. Chan calls this persistent changes. Basically, it means that the dungeon remembers what the players have done, and their choices have consequences that ripple throughout the campaign. So it's like the dungeon is a living record of the players' adventures. It's a really cool way to create a sense of continuity and make the players feel like their actions matter. Definitely. 
Imagine a flooded chamber that the players created to escape an enemy, slowly developing its own unique ecosystem. Or a collapsed tunnel, becoming a shortcut for future adventurers. It's all about making the dungeon feel reactive and personalized to the player's actions. You have to think twice about everything mm -hmm. you do, knowing that it might come back to haunt you later. It also makes returning to a dungeon much more interesting. You never know how your past actions might have changed things. That's a really neat idea. But it's not all sunshine and roses. Chan also talks about the darker side of living dungeons. He calls it Dungeon's Revenge. The idea is that a dungeon can actually seek revenge on those who have wronged it. It can extend its influence beyond its walls to get back at the players. Oh, okay, now that's scary. It's not just about traps and monsters anymore. It's about something much more personal and targeted. Right. Imagine a group of adventurers who have looted the dungeon, desecrated its sacred spaces, or maybe even killed one of its guardians. The dungeon might not be too happy about that. I can imagine. It might send shadowy agents to whisper haunting messages in the player's dreams, or maybe curse them with some kind of debilitating affliction. So even escaping the dungeon doesn't guarantee safety. It's like the dungeon can reach out and touch you wherever you go. That's the idea. It adds a whole other level of dread to the game. It really makes you question the whole idea of conquering a dungeon. It's not just about defeating monsters and taking treasure anymore. It's about understanding that you're dealing with something that might be far more powerful and cunning than you initially thought. Yeah, it's not just about brute force anymore. It's about strategy and diplomacy and maybe even a little bit of respect for the dungeon itself. Exactly. It's a whole new way of thinking about dungeon crawling. You know, we often think of dungeons as these huge, sprawling labyrinths. But the idea of a living dungeon could work on a smaller scale, too, right? Like even a single room or a small complex could be a living dungeon. Oh, absolutely. You could have a classic fetch quest where the players have to retrieve a magical artifact. But instead of the artifact being locked in some boring treasure vault, it's actually part of the room itself. So instead of fighting their way to the artifact, they have to figure out how to get it without destroying the room or even killing it. Right. It becomes a puzzle, a challenge that requires more than just brute force. Do they try to carefully remove the artifact, risking the whole structure collapsing? Or maybe they try to appease the room somehow, offering gifts or performing some kind of ritual? Or maybe they could even create a fake artifact and trick the room into giving up the real one. I like that. The possibilities are endless. It just goes to show that even the smallest environments can be really interesting if you approach them with the right mindset. And that brings us back to one of the most important things about Living Dungeon's personality. If a dungeon is truly alive, it needs to have its own unique character, right? It's not just some mindless force of nature. It has its own motivations and desires and even flaws. Right. It's like every Living Dungeon has its own soul. And understanding that soul is the key to surviving its challenges and uncovering its secrets. Imagine a dungeon that's ancient and wise, but also really vain. The players could use that to their advantage, right? Flattering the dungeon, appealing to its ego. Maybe they could even manipulate its defenses that way. Or maybe you have a dungeon that's fiercely protective of its inhabitants. The players could earn its trust by helping those inhabitants, maybe healing a wounded creature or solving a problem that's plaguing the dungeon. That's a cool idea. It adds this whole moral dimension to the game. And of course, not all dungeons are going to be benevolent. Some might be paranoid and suspicious, seeing every intruder as a threat. Others might be bored and looking for entertainment. Oh, man. The players become the dungeon's playthings, forced to play deadly games or solve riddles to amuse it. It turns the whole dungeon crawl into a psychological thriller. It's amazing how many possibilities there are when you start thinking about dungeons as characters. It really elevates the whole experience. It's not just about fighting monsters and finding treasure anymore. It's about interacting with a living, breathing world and understanding that your choices have real consequences. Well, I think we've covered just about everything there is to say about living dungeons. We've talked about the mechanics, the st storytelling potential, and even the psychological aspects. It's a concept that's both fascinating and incredibly versatile. And it's a great example of how creative and imaginative tabletop RPGs can be. A big thanks again to Paul Bello, that fine fellow in Lit RPG Reads, for giving us so much to think about. It's been a great discussion. And to all our listeners out there, we'd love to hear your thoughts on living dungeons. What kind of unique personality traits or challenges would you give to your own living dungeon? Let us know in the comments below. And until next time, happy gaming!